Hi everyone, uh, my name is not Mark Coleman and I'm not talking about marketing f uh, driven development. So if you are hoping to see that talk, this would be a good time to uh, either learn about how we do continuous delivery for uh, embedded systems or find somewhere else to be. Because uh, unfortunately I know nothing about marketing. So I'm a continuous delivery consultant, but that's not my that's not been my career. Actually, I spent most of my career working with embedded systems. And for me, the interesting thing in the last 10 years is how much that's changed. I mean, when I started in 2004 making embedded systems, it was a very different industry than it is today. And most of that's to do with what we would call continuous delivery these days. And that's what I want to talk about. Just out of interest, how many people here currently work on embedded systems projects or product development or have done in the past? Okay, cool. I didn't expect that. Uh, there is an app. There are buttons on it. Push them all. So this is what we're going to talk about. Uh, what is continuous delivery? I think I'm going to go through this really fast because this might be the tenth explanation of what is continuous delivery today. Uh, and then we'll talk about you know the embedded stuff. So going back to 2004, I was a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed uh, recent graduate from uh, university. And I was—I uh, joined a company, and I was—I uh, was the sole software engineer on a on a, a product. Uh, the the idea was we were going to build a drilling tool for the oil and gas industry that you could steer as it spun around. We would steer it through the through the uh, through the ground, and eventually hit oil. Uh, I didn't know anything about professional software development at this stage, so I took a lot of notes, and I'm going to share them with you today. So I managed to reverse engineer what professional software development was from, from that uh, very interesting project. So the first thing you do is you want to take a copy of the uh, code base for an existing product. Uh, this is a great way to start because it's already been tested. And you know, you're professional, and you don't want to uh, cause any harm to the existing product. So you make your own little sandbox copy. Then you carefully document all of its current algorithms because you don't really know what it's supposed to do or how it works. So I mean, this is a really important thing to get right, so spend a few months on this. And then because you want to hopefully merge your changes back into the original uh, code base that you copied from, you add all your changes surrounded by if diffs. And of course, if you put it surrounded by if diffs, everyone will know what code to look at. And then you, you test, and you test, and you test, and you go to the field, and you test, and you test, and you test. And then eventually you get to this, the stage where you're kind of happy it will probably work. Uh, you commit the code at this stage. This is when you have to figure out what a, a version control system is. Uh, you have to find out how to add code to a version control system. Uh, and so you add all that stuff in. Maybe you put it in a zip file. That might be easier, but that's what you do. And then, of course, now it's ready. So you have to compile it on your laptop, because that's what you tested. So you have to have the same environment. And then you ship it. You put it into the, the product database for the tool, manufacturing, go off and make a 1,000 of them. Has anyone ever done professional software development? Uh, well, yeah, I know I have. <laughs> uh, the reason I knew it was professional was because we had a software development process that I followed to the letter. And that was part of the product development uh, uh, process, which was in turn part of the product management uh, governance system. So uh, this was professional software development. Of course, I'm being sarcastic, but actually, this was how this this was how my very first project in, in industry was, and I think this is completely typical in the embedded systems world. Uh, as far as I've seen, I've seen a lot of projects, and this is more typical than any other uh, software development process we might have heard of. Um, Eugene Spafford, he's a professor at the university, and he's talking about the changes that we have in attitudes towards uh, the, the way we implement these systems, these uh, typically safety-critical systems. And he tells a story about the this was around the 1990s when there was the 
the start of the fly-by-wire systems in airplanes. And there was, a, there was always a joke amongst the engineers because Boeing, uh, Airbus would uh, use a lot of formal uh, testing, formal methods, uh, formal testing, and then the guys at Boeing, they would instead focus on peer review and, um, and they would also send the engineers on test flights. So they thought that, you know, that would give them the added incentive to, to get things right. And, ba and back in the 90s, the, the joke was, well, I'd rather fly Boeing because, you know, they had their necks on the line, right? But I think things have changed now where we'd rather see that the, there was a formal proof to show that the, these systems work. And that's just another example of the, the changes that have happened. So we know that uh, continuous delivery is quite a recent name, but it comes from the Agile Manifesto the, of the, the Principle 1 and Principle 7 from the Agile Manifesto kind of where the, where, the, where the names for these things came from. Uh, we know that continuous integration is, is this code good enough to share with my colleagues? And we know continuous delivery is, is this code potentially shippable? So you just push them together and that's, that's the story of what continuous delivery is. Now, continuous delivery as a concept is very easy to grasp, especially amongst anyone that comes from some kind of engineering or management background. I mean, it's simple. You have basically a bunch of checkpoints, and if you go through them all, then your code is OK. Uh, the challenge is with, I think, a lot of times the tools and the context, because as a, as a concept, it's very easy. But on the implementation side, it's much more difficult. So. One of, the th one of the things that's always like the, the, the central tenet of continuous integration is that you're integrating, right? You're always integrating with all your other colleagues. So then we have to think about how we do version control. So we end up going towards a release train where you have only one long-lived branch. Instead of, for instance, making a copy of a code base, you would always live in the same version control system, always have one source of truth. Now. Uh, this, there's a great book from Hewlett Packard. Actually, it's printed by Addison Wesley, but it's about the story of the HP LaserJet business line and the, the transformation they went through from 2006 to 2011. And the, the, that's an example of also how to change very embedded systems and the way you deliver them. And the, there's a great story in this about what they call product variants. And I think. Uh, this is also something very common in, in the embedded systems world, is that you use these um, use branches in a very, very wrong way, and that we take a new branch for each product. And then we'll cherry pick changes around when we need to. So in the end, you have 12 products, you have 12 branches, and you never know what's fixed where. So if, if, you, if you are living in that world, I recommend uh, trying to do something about it as soon as possible because it causes an awful lot of waste in your system. And if you are interested at all in embedded systems, this is a great book. But then the thing about embedded systems is there are challenges that we don't see in any of the other talks we saw today, actually. Um, and it's, I think it's to do a lot with the tools as well. Uh, the, the people making web apps or, or, or making iPhone apps or so on, there's millions of developers all working on these systems, so they have huge tooling support. And that's, that's something that we're really lacking in the embedded system space. But as well as the tooling, there's, there's the fact that we're nearly always working on our own. And, and yeah, that's, that's true that we, we, we don't get all the feedback from all the other people, but we also lose the chance to, to, to learn from, from bigger pieces of software and making them, making them together to, to, to think about these things. Um, what we tend to do is instead have these kind of fire and forget pro uh, code bases where we're trying as best as we can to, uh, to make a product that we end up manufacturing somewhere uh, abroad, which we make a thousand, a hundred thousand, a million of these devices, and we never touch that code again. And I think that's part of the reason why we, sh we struggle with quality. It's also partly like why would you invest in uh, making good automated tooling support when you know that in two months no one's going to change this code again. So that's one side of the coin. But the other side of the coin is actually a lot of embedded systems are long-lived and they are product lines that go on for a long, long time. This is the, this is the uh, 
iOS product line. But I've been on, uh, actually, when I was working in marine seismic acquisition, we would build systems with a 20 to 30 year timeline horizon. So when you build embedded systems in that environment, you have a very different approach to uh, what is a good uh, investment in terms of the long term. Another challenge we have is generally we don't have we don't have the, the, the hardware that the, the software is going to run in. So as you start developing it, you don't really know what your target environment is going to be like. Never mind how to automate and deploy, how to automate testing. All these things are very difficult. This, so uh, this is Life Over, and he's one of my programming her heroes. Uh, and he's my programming hero for never have written a line of code in an entire year. He was uh, brought in as a specialist to try and solve a, a very difficult bug we had uh, in one of our systems that was very intermittent, and you would almost never see it. But when you had thousands of these things out there running in production, it would happen all the time. So anyway, he spent three months at, in the lab just trying to figure out what the problem was, how to reproduce it, because it was weird. He would add in a printf, and all of a sudden, the bug would appear, and he would shuffle a couple of lines of code down, and the bug would disappear. And it seemed like there was some kind of ghost in the machine. Uh, so eventually, he, he made it so that he could actually reproduce this thing at will. And then it became quite a lot easier to get to the problem. Not simple. What turned out to be the issue was uh, the operating system uh, the, uh, had some registers for uh, when you did context switching from kernel to to task. So when you when you did a context switch, it would sh save all the registers, didn't go into the interrupt context and so on. But it wouldn't save them all. And there was one uh, one little flag in one register that determined whether a uh, uh, a loop should terminate. So the way this bug would manifest itself was all of a sudden you would exit a while true loop, and nobody could figure out how that was even possible. And it was just because uh, we, we had no control over that. So we had two problems. One is that the compiler vendor had gone out of business. So we, we had no luck there. And two, the operating system company had been bought by another operating system company and discontinued the product. So in both cases, there was no solution, except we were very lucky and that at the end of the, the routine that was saving the registers, the compiler had inserted a seven no-op instructions, as that often does to, to uh, get memory alignment uh, nice. So we were able to patch the binary just to save that one register. And that's why LifeOva is my programming hero. But I, I mean, this is another example of where the tools and the, the systems we use are really a pain in, in embedded systems. And I think that this story is also a, a large motivation for why nowadays we're moving more and more to using open source tools and embedded systems when we can. We're going for free RTOS, we're going for GCC compilers, we're going for some really standard ARM architectures when we can. Uh, the other problem we have, of course, is uh, is right here is the the license management. All of our tools, they cost thirty thousand dollars, and they come with this big, big license. So sp to have an extra license just for test automation is actually quite a hard sell in a lot of organisations. So versioning is an interesting one in embedded systems because it actually matters. It matters a lot more than it does in uh, in, for instance, cloud environments where the idea is you just keep moving forward. Like Google is never going to try and reproduce the exact build that happened six months ago. They're just going to build something new. But they don't care. But for embedded systems, you really care. Because if you made a product that you shipped 10,000 radars to, uh, to a supplier, and you won't, they come back with a, a, a problem two years later and say, you know, we're getting this error. We need to be able to reproduce that exact build with, uh, in order to be able to, to help them. So like getting there, it's, it's, you have to start right from the very beginning. What is a version? Thankfully, I mean, we have a lot of help now with semantic versioning. I think 
nobody's mentioned semantic versioning today, so I'll just give a brief introduction. There is a website, semver.org, and it just gives a brief uh, overview. But the idea behind semantic versioning is that you use the version numbers mean something, and you can you can use the numbers to relate to dependencies. So first of all, you have whatever the artifact is, and then the major minor patch numbers, which is your normal software approach. The important thing is like in this semantic versioning, major means uh, breaking changes, minor means non-breaking changes, and patch levels means bug fixes. Then you can have some pre-release version after it if you so choose, alpha, beta, RC1, or nothing. And then everything after the plus sign, you are free to do what whatever you really want. So a typical thing I would do is to add a build number and then the git short shaft or the, the source version where it came from in the, the version control repository. Is anyone using semantic versioning just now? Only this side of the room. What are you guys doing? <laughs> so you can also specify snapshot versions for like the rolling builds and so on. So what we do in the embedded systems is we, we want to get all that information not only on the file name, it's not enough to have it on the file name because we never see the file once we've shipped a product. We need to build it into the binary so that we can either read it out through a debug port or we can, uh, we can look at the flash and use strings on it or something. But the important thing is this information has to be stamped into the binaries. So I mean, this is a typical thing you would do. You have a build.h where you, during in your Jenkins build or whatever, you would, you would stamp in the real information there. And then you have uh, a, a version header file, which kind of brings it all together. Nothing, nothing too strange here. The important thing is that during your build, you include this, and you find a way to tell the world about it once, you, once you're in runtime. Now then, there, th this is an old, an old story. Uh, I think maybe even 15 years old, this blog post is from uh, Jeff Atwood. Uh, and he was talking about, back then, uh, for a lot of developers, F5 button was their build process. And it was a nightmare because it only worked on one developer's machine and a build on one machine was different from another machine. So he, he wrote this very good blog post about getting your build process out of the ID and putting it into a script. And, and that's great. Uh, it's really good advice. Uh, it's still something we struggle with in embedded systems, but uh, it's just as valid today. But there's still a couple of things missing from that equation. Is like the traceability is even if you put it in a build script, how can you find out exactly the build environment for this build? And this, the second thing is reproducibility. Even if you have it as a script, can you build the thing again with the same results? And as engineers, oh, well we say, OK, well, well, I've seen people talk at conferences about continuous delivery. I know, I just have to put this in Jenkins. And so they, they create a Jenkins job with all that information. And that is an improvement, because then you have at least one place where you have that global context. But there is still a problem that, in a sense, this is still pressing F5 in your IDE. Because you've got no control over what someone does in that, in that job configuration. Uh, they could come along and change that. Like the build, a build job today could be have been completely different six months ago, and even the the build machine it ran on could have changed. So uh, a common next step would be to use like a, a something like job DSL where you can define your jobs as code and version that alongside your your source code. Anybody using job DSL or Jenkins workflow? No, oh, you should check it out. It's a really great system. And then beyond that, it's okay. Now you've got some automation. How about the rest of your ecosystem? What about the context that all this builds run in? Uh, how do you trace the the version of in the source code to your your tracker? There was a guy from Atlassian talking about hey, how they do it in their system. There's a lot of ways to track your your work to your code to your build to your build environment to the artifacts that were made to the way they were deployed. There's solutions everywhere. Uh, but the, in the end, the whole idea is the same. You want to get all of, your, uh, all of your configuration, everything that's a context around your build system as code so that you can version it alongside your, your, uh, your, your code and uh, you can go back in time. 
because it's it's quite common in embedded systems to say we need uh, we produced this prototype a year ago. It's been some suppliers have tried it for a few for six months, nine months. They've actually built a product out of it. Now they want a hundred thousand of them. But can you just change these few things? And only those few things. So configuration as code can really help with that. Uh, well that's enough about that. Now then, testing. Uh, testing is hard. It's always been hard. That's why we don't do it. <laughs> but uh, it, it is possible. I mean, we still have a test pyramid. Um, there's lots of different test pyramids. This is why not use Martin Fowler's. Uh, we don't have a UI usually. Sometimes we do, but we still have a system, and we still want to do full system tests. Uh, we, in order to do system tests, we have to overcome a lot of things, though, right? We need to be able to control power. We need to be able to program the device, you know, download the f things onto Flash. We need to control physical actuators. We need to sense the results somehow. Uh, we have to crack open the black box and control its, co its bounded context. Uh, and these are all solved problems. It's just work, right? We generally don't have a service-oriented architecture either. But we do have components, and it's really valid to do component tests. If you have a signal processing library, take each step in that signal processing chain and, f and have a test harness around it. Have a vice so that you know if the noise floor changes, you're not going to get into trouble. And unit tests are unit tests, and they're applicable. You should use them everywhere. They're great. So you might be thinking, why do if, if I have all those unit tests, why do I need full system tests? Or if I have system tests that test my whole thing as a box, why do I need to bother with writing all those unit tests? Isn't it duplication? And I used to worry about that quite a lot when I was a young man. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't until I read this book, Growing Object Oriented Code uh, Guided by Tests, that I actually I, I, I really grasped the, the meaning behind this. And it was the, the point is that different kinds of tests give you different kinds of feedback. So unit tests give you an awful lot of feedback about the internal quality of the code, how easy it is to change, how internally correct it is, how well understood it is from the programmer's point of view. But uh, on, it tells you nothing about whether the system as, it's, as a whole meets the, the requirements of the customer or as, as a whole does it work as a product. On the other hand, the, the full system test tell you heaps about that. It tells you, as a whole, this system does what the customer wants. But it tells you nothing about how safe and quickly you can change it. So that's why you need both. So test everywhere. Uh, test on your host, uh, because that's fast. It's a really fast way to develop. While you're doing your unit tests away from hardware on the host, that's a great way to, to have a productive development environment. But also test on the target, because on the target, things are different. Things can, behavior can change in different ways. We've got different compilers. We've got uh, different hardware behavior. Uh, and th some customers that I know, they actually ship their the unit tests as part of their product builds. Uh, I know Cisco does this, at least. Uh, and so that if they get a customer call and say, we're having trouble with this machine, they can SSH into the device and run the unit test and see if anything looks a bit spooky. Because uh, sometimes it could be just that there's a dodgy memory or, 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 or the flash is uh, flaky. You, ne you never know. Obviously, shipping your tests really depends on what the device is. I mean, not everybody has room, at least, for those things. A company I've been doing some work with, a uh, very interesting company, they make a radar system. A tiny little radar like this, uh, very low power. Uh, and they solved uh, a very interesting uh, testing problem, was that how do you test, like how do you test a radar system in a, in a reproducible manner? Like they make these things that can uh, detect presence in a room or uh, see how fast you're breathing. Uh, check like creating baby monitors and so on. And one of their engineers actually figured out that actually if you take a ball bearing about 0 0.9 centimeters in size and rotate it like this, to a radar it looks just like the chest cavity of a, of a baby. 
And you know, you make a bigger ball bearing, it's a, an adult chest, a smaller ball bearing, it's a premature baby. And what they figured out is, well, actually, Lego is plastic, so it doesn't give much reflection on a radar. So why don't we, why don't we set up a lab with, uh, with, all this <laughs> with all this Lego and ball bearings? And they have an automation system around that. So, I mean, it's a nice story, but it, it kind of, every time I've seen a, uh, an interest, uh, a full system end-to-end -end, uh, test on an embedded system, it's always required a bit of out-of-the-box thinking. That's, that's why another reason why we often don't do it. But, uh, but it, it's a really valuable thing. If, if you can automate all that systems, you can get a lot of feedback about your, about your software. OK, some, some tips. Uh, avoid using the preprocessor, uh, at least for product variants. Uh, it will mean you have to build lots of different uh, uh, systems. Like you basically have to build for every different type instead of having uh, one file built one time. You can have one built one file built seventeen times depending on how you, how your product variants interact. It, it also lowers the cohesion because when you're looking at the code, you you don't know actually if this is in, if this is included if that's included. It's really easy to make mistakes. Uh, only build your binaries once as well. Uh, because what you want to do is make sure whatever you build is the same thing you test and it's the same thing you ship. There's no sense in uh, building something, doing a bunch of tests, and then doing another build later, maybe when you stamp the version. That's just a waste. It, it's a way that errors can leak into your system. Uh, just about everything to do with continuous delivery is about a feedback loop. Basically, you want to get more and more feedback from your system so you can go faster. So the TDD gives you feedback that as a developer, I'm writing the code that I actually think I'm writing. That if statement actually is the if statement I wrote. And then you go to con uh, continuous integration, you can say, well, actually, that code that I wrote actually works with uh, Dave's code or John's code. And then you start to think further up the system, you get to like the, the build, measure, learn of uh, customer feedback. and like. The, the product I made and shipped to the customers is giving me this feedback on the market, so we should do more of that. And another thing is that the development environment is, I mean, more and more companies see it as a competitive advantage, not just in terms of we can use this to go faster, but I know, peop I know it's really common for engineers to say, I want to work at it, I, I don't want to work for them because it takes it takes two days to get the code committed. Well, I don't want to work in a system that, uh, I don't want to work in, a, in an old version control system. And, and these things are really important when it comes to recruitment. But also, uh, it matters a lot to customers. Customers care a lot about how quickly you can get this stuff to market. And I'll, I want to give some examples of that. Does anyone here drive a Tesla? No, no, me either. I wish I did. <laughs> but. Uh, one of the really nice features of the Tesla is that it has this over-the-air update system. So um, over in, in the night, it will get new software, and it will run some self-tests. And then in the morning, you'll get into the car, and it'll, it'll say, OK. And there was the famous story is that there was a, a user who was uh, really upset on the product forums because uh, when he was at a stop sign on, on a hill, and he took his foot off the brake and put it on the accelerator, the car would go back a little bit. And he was like, this is ridiculous. Lots of cars have got hill start features. You should be able to keep the, the brake depressed a bit if it's on a hill. Uh, and OK, somebody, in, I guess, in product marketing saw this. And then it went through the, the, the engineering division. I hope it was tested. But eventually, <laughs> it was <laughs> shipped to somebody's car. And can you imagine you know, how happy he'd be getting into his car three months after complaining on the forum and p putting it on his car saying, oh, you've got a hill start feature. Uh, that's kind of, that's one, of, that's like the, the poster child of, of how it could be if things go great. But there's also another side, right? Is that uh, security experts hack your product. Oh no. And that's, that's a big problem for a lot of embedded systems, uh, especially if you ship like Bash, for instance. Or, or SSL, or anything that has uh, all kinds of vulnerabilities that get discovered after it's been shipped. Uh, this actually turned out to be quite a positive story for Tesla. Um, 
yes, the headline is not pretty, but actually further down in the article, they say that the researchers that found this problem, they were actually gave a lot of praise to Tesla because uh, when the security researchers came to them, they said, okay, great, thank you for finding this, we'll fix it. They fixed it and pushed it over the air to all the cars, right? There's a flip side is that Fiat Chrysler had to recall 1.4 mil million vehicles because of bugs found on their onboard systems. And uh, okay, this, is, this isn't fear mongering, but I mean, an, a, re a product recall can cost an awful lot of money. Uh, and so being able to have a, a, an update system and a continuous delivery system can really uh, make a big difference in your, in your, uh, in your business. Okay, so that was a quick kind of tour through embedded systems uh, and continuous delivery and how those things go together. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? I think we have time. Okay, so the question is, could could customers be upset if they, they get new features that, or at least the functionality that they had before changes? And I think that's definitely a risk, you know. It's the risk with every kind of update of any kind. Like as soon as you're starting to move people's cheese, it, it, there's a chance that they're going to be upset. So I think that the, for Tesla, at least, they, they've managed to make their customers really happy because they feel like they're they're basically getting added value. They didn't buy a car, and then that was it. And then they have to get the next one two years later. They bought a car that was continuously improving, and I think that's one of the reasons why customers uh, really like it. And especially when it comes to like these stories of security vulnerabilities and new features that you really wanted, but they didn't have at the beginning. I, I think that in general, it's a positive thing. So the question is about how, to, how do I feel about simulators and, and I guess emulators as well. Um, so th again, the, they're all, they can be useful tools. And th th as long as they improve your feedback cycle, then there's no reason why not to use them. Uh, and to use them during the testing phase, especially if you don't have hardware yet, because quite often it's quite late in the, the the development process when we finally get our hands on this on the on real uh, hardware. So using uh, simulators early on is very helpful, and writing test systems around simulators can be very helpful as well, because once the hardware arrives, you can replace the simulator for the real hardware, and you'll have a full test suite ready. Actually, when I started with TDD. Uh, uh, a while ago, uh, it was because I was I was writing a power supply controller, and uh, I didn't have the hardware. The hardware was not ready yet. And rather than sit and write documentation, I actually wrote the the power supply controller with unit tests off target on the host, uh, and with just with mock uh, mocking out the actual hardware interaction. And then when it came along. Uh, I just uh, I just ran it on on target and it seemed to work fine. And after that, the management gave me a lot of uh, support to to try and uh, spread this through different other parts of the systems because it, they could see that actually they got working software faster than than they did from just hoping that the the, the data sheet that he got sent was the correct information. So the question is about risk adversity and and the. Uh, in the industry and how that relates to continuous delivery. And I think there is a lot of risk. Uh, there, is a f there is a fear in, in the industry, for sure. But I think that, in, t in general, the embedded s software industry seems to address the risk. As I, 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 I think it's more like they're trying to get quality by being careful. So they build these very fancy development processes and very strict review processes, and then they'll they'll take Misra C and then make sure that you have to do this and you have to do that, and 17 people have to look at each line of code, and it becomes like this quality by being careful, and, it, and it's not really it's kind of it, there's no real security in that, and I think that once an organization starts to adopt more automated processes around testing, especially, that they start to see that okay this is much more valuable, in the end you you're as a, as a developer, you're always just adding code, right? Whether it's going into something that is continuously tested or not, it doesn't really matter. I mean, after it's shipped, when you're doing updates, that's another risk factor as well. But I think in general, having all those safety nets of the, the testing is uh, where I've seen it happen, people have really valued it.
So the question is, how does uh, does TDD and BDD and these things help improve uh, software design and hard w and hardware design? I, I haven't seen it actually impact hardware design at all. In fact, I've I've seen very little evidence that software engineers have any ability to to make any effect on hardware design at all. <laughs> um, but uh, in terms of the software, yes, a huge a huge improvement in the software design because. Uh, one is that you have to stop relying on the preprocessor for doing a lot of kind of ugly hacks uh, because otherwise you can't test your code. And then you have to be really clean about your, uh, your dependencies when you start using uh, testing. So even if you're using C and so on, you really want to have isolated modules and you want to control uh, what, what is public and what is private, what is, uh, you know, what is static. All these things really help. And, uh, I mean, I've only seen maybe 10, maybe even not that many, 10 uh, embedded systems and uh, projects that have really dived into TDD, but they've all had really excellent code quality. OK, well, thanks. Um, remember to rate the session and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>